I deliver this recording in what I believe will be the final hour of my life. I can only hope that when this message reaches home, it will be heard and taken with the utmost seriousness. My name is Galexin. I am, or was, the commander of the 4th Piration Band. And I know my world has heard of me. For years, our pirates have raided worlds and trade routes with impunity. I am sure this part will be censored when or if it is broadcast successfully to our population. But I want to say it anyway. We acted as agents of the Governing Council. With their permission, both tacit and explicit, depending on where we were going and who we were attacking. Sometimes, I admit, we struck at places outside of the concerns of our government, and of course, since it was outside of their concerns, who cared? Screams can be heard in the background. Forgive me, the smoke is starting to make its way in. It won't be long now, I will be quick. We raided Terra because it was easy, and because the race seemed weak. I mean, whoever heard of a species of intelligence sacrificing mature and productive adults for their young, when they not only can just make more, but enjoy doing so at every opportunity. When they first ventured into interstellar space and made contact with our enemies, it's probable that they had no idea that the invitation to join a trade alliance was an invitation to be invaded. But once they did, hey, easy pickings, right? No grand military fleet, no massive space stations or networks of defenses. They had only begun to draw up plans to harvest the energy of the stars en masse. Like I said, easy. So we hit the place, a few capitals, blew up some bases. Oh, we had a grand old pirate time, as we always have. And we put ourselves in reach, which was one of our biggest mistakes. We took communities easily enough at first. But then one of our people during a harvest grew annoyed at the sound of a crying infant of their species. They have a horrific wail, so he shot it in the arms of what we now know was one of their females. No big deal, just make another, right? We thought wrong. The woman lost all reason and attacked our raiders. She was shot 16 times, but she beat one of us to death with his own weapon. That was when we found the other thing out. Humans tell stories. A lot. This story, well, they recorded it. Evidently, they record a lot. And the sight of one of our officers killing one of their infants in its mother's arms, and then her beating him to death with his own weapon before she was finally killed, too, sparked an outbreak of violence that cost me four companies in a day. Then, one of my idiot officers decided that since they love children so much, we would threaten to kill more of them if they didn't stand down. Big mistake. He showed them that we were kitty killing monsters. And when humans decide that something is dangerous to their young, they will stop at nothing to destroy it. There's gunfire. Screams cut short, the sound of humans shouting beyond the door. You have to understand, it isn't just my band. They've decided our entire race is a threat to their young. The last interceptions we made of their communications showed that the Keelan Confederation was going to trade them weapons and technology to join the war in earnest. We picked up home communications. The whole planet has gone mad with hatred for us. Steal their goods, nobody cares. Kill an adult, they get upset but kill their young, and they lose all reason or care for their own lives. If they have any sense of self-preservation left when it comes to wiping us out, I can't find it. I tried negotiating. I tried trading. I tried warning and threatening them, and all that meant was that their convictions were hardened. Whatever you do, do not target their young. You'll doom us all. We thought that would make things easy, and we thought wrong. Human shouts intensify. Scream of pain, then silence. And that is the last report of the most powerful pirate fleet commander in the last 500 cycles. Since that time, humans have exterminated four military bases and done self-termination runs against entire fleets, crippling operations in 14 quadrants. I am afraid the war is as good as lost. Therefore, I recommend we offer terms to the Keelan Confederation that are favorable to peace, including a mandate that they cease to supply humans with weapons and technology. In addition, in the post-war period, I move that we propose to the Galactic Union that we make it unlawful to employ human mercenaries or to supply weapons to human armies, and make it a war crime to target human young in any operation under any circumstances. 
Perhaps news of that will help them realize that we are not all the same as the late pirate lord. Will that work? Many voices asked the question. How much longer? Everybody asked that question. North America, South America, Eastern Europe, Asia, the Indian subcontinent. Everywhere there was a story of one of the pirate band that raided humanity executing someone's infant for being loud. So the question, how much longer, kept coming. The Keelan Confederation's ships were tracked on the global net. Their first transmissions of technological data for interstellar travel had already been given to every government on Earth. Every session of the United Government that began to form in the wake of the stories and videos began the same way. The sound of a crying child, a shot from a pirate weapon, and a mother's screams. And only then would humans debate. It was played in the new shipyards that were already being built. It was being played in the United Infantry Training Grounds that sprung up around the world. It was being played in the mech construction factories and training centers. And every day, new reports about their preparations were sent to the Keelan Confederation government. And that same question, how much longer, began to haunt the Confederation itself, because with it, their monitoring of Terran communications came more of their cultural exchange information, stories, songs, poetry, movies, histories, and it was days before the first transport ships were due to arrive on Earth. Their horror movies are concerning, the chief anthropologist remarked. He stroked his scales in a nervous gesture, shedding some of the dead flecks to the floor. Not the alien invasion movies, a politician asked with a huffing noise that passed for laughter. Those too, but not for the reason you think. The problem is that every alien invasion and every horror movie monster is so over the top it is utterly ridiculous. Monsters that are immortal, or ghosts that can't die, things like that. Or aliens with such impossible technology that they defy the laws of physics. The chief anthropologist replied, his reptilian tail lashed at his back as his anxiety grew worse. Why is that so concerning? the politician asked because that is the only thing in the universe they consider to be a threat. It has to be gods or angels or demons or impossible monsters or impossible aliens. Anything less than that, they don't consider it reasonable to feel afraid of. If it can't break a planet, it isn't a problem they're worried about. You heard what they did to the admiral of the pirate fleet, didn't you? He was basically a lord they tore his limbs off. Eventually. The chief anthropologist shuddered. I tell you, sir, I've never seen a species this insanely protective of their young. The father of one of the boys dragged one of the pirates to death behind a two-wheeled motorized contraption and handed over only shreds of flesh to our ambassador when we asked what happened. They're insane, and they're now convinced that our enemies want to kill their children. The chief anthropologist held out his hands with finger claws upturned. We may just be inviting disaster unless we tread carefully. I understand we need the reinforcements, but this species is the most homicidal, suicidal, bloodthirsty species I've ever come across. One of their stories has their literal god coming down, pissing some of them off, and they nail him alive to wood to die. My assistant went there on a visit and... He chewed on his tongue for a moment. And what? The politician asked. He was assigned to study their military culture to see how it distinguishes from the rest of their castes, only to find that they have no castes. Anyone can fulfill any role they want. He asked one of their pilots how they'd take down a jamming ship that kept AI from piloting things, and he said just blow up the jamming ship. My assistant pointed out that you can't do that because the signal would be jammed, and the pilot said that it didn't matter as long as you just used a living pilot instead. The chief anthropologist shuddered. The politician shrugged. Grossly exaggerated, I'm sure. I know some of my colleagues are bothered by this, but as long as they can help us win, I fail to see the problem. The chief anthropologist could only walk away in defeat, leaving a nervous trail of shed skin behind him. Three months later, let the humans take the casualties. The Keelan admiral said, they're asking for the first run. It was a request that was happily granted. The Keelan-provided starships were piloted by humans, but they were not piloted like Keelan pilots intended. The Admiral watched with dismay as fighters skipped like smooth stones over the atmosphere of the planet, 
and sent out a transmission audible to both sides, unencrypted. Does anybody have a translation for yippee ki yay motherfucker? The admiral asked, heads shook. In contradiction to doctrine, the long ships bounced along the atmosphere, confusing ground defenses and unleashed withering fire on the planetary defenses. Again, contradicting doctrine, which said that ground troops should only come down after the area was secure, the human piloted ships were coming in fast and descended at dangerous speeds as soon as they were able to breach the atmosphere of the world. Some sense of foreboding or hope or uncertainty or something he could not truly name compelled him to his next orders. Put the surface on screen, the admiral barked, and broadcast this back home. The screen came up and showed the transports opening up and the human jumpers emerging from the bottom of the transports. Humans are machines, he asked, and his crew shrugged it off. That was when the second broadcast hit. The sound of some wailing, a familiar sound of a weapon going off, and the scream of a human woman. This broadcast was as unencrypted as the rest and clearly intended to be heard by all, and it seemed to drive the humans mad. Then he saw the flesh pilots and the human love of overkill. The machines the humans piloted were heavy lumbering things with massive arms equipped with guns mounted with projectile weapons the size of a body. Contemporary strategy involved capturing positions, but the human heavy infantry had no interest in capturing positions. Each of their mechs had mounted rockets on both shoulders, dozens of small ones that were launched at any building in their path. The Pankin Alliance had soldiers aplenty, but they fought as if they wished to live. The humans fought as if they were there to kill and didn't care if they died in the process. The first transports holding secondary light infantry began to land moments after their mechanized walkers. These used light rocket-powered air sleds that shot over the battlefield. These lightly armored soldiers sprayed chaff everywhere to cripple the laser-based weapons of the surviving defenders the white mist wreaking havoc on their ability to resist. This isn't war, this is revenge. Are they insane? Are they insane? The admiral asked the question twice and still got no answer. Whoever controlled the monitor began to zoom in on the close fighting and saw the twisted mask of hatred on the Terran face of a light infantryman. His projectile weapon's sharp gleam at the front suddenly had a clear purpose. They put knives on guns! The admiral half stammered as the Terran infantryman gutted the Pankin Alliance soldier, shouting in rage as if it had been his own young to be killed by the pirates. The admiral tried to imagine, from what twisted depths of the abyss can hate like that come from? What is he thinking about? Doesn't he know what he's doing? Is he a machine? He whispered his exclamation. Sir, we have an incoming transmission from the Terran admiral the officer said without tearing his eyes away from the screen, while the screen zoomed out and showed a battle-mad Terran pick up a severed arm and beat an unfortunate to death with it. What, what is he saying? The admiral asked. He's saying that we're unnecessary. The Pankin turned out not to be as fierce as he was led to believe. The officer on comms and translations waited for his admiral to answer but as they saw the Terran banner raised over the last standing building and the human infantry and mechanized forces set fire to the last pank and stronghold in the area and shoot down those who were trying to flee. The admiral could not argue. Tell him, it's fine. We'll take the next world when we leave next month. The admiral responded. His comms and translations officer relayed that, and then his scales began to shed horribly. They're not waiting, sir. He says, follow with supplies, but the next world is only one jump away and not ready. He didn't use many supplies, so we can follow when we're ready. Weeks later at the Keelan Confederacy Assembly. Fourteen worlds in fourteen months. The war's progress has completely reversed itself. The Pankin are offering terms of surrender. Some strange ones. Some that I can understand. But there is another question we have to ask. Will the humans be willing to make peace? The assembly heard the question asked by their revered speaker, and they were silent. The transmissions sent out by the various fleets of human military operations ranged from the insane to the astonishing. They were rapidly becoming known across galactic civilizations as the war apes.
and they were beginning to appear in popular media and propaganda regarding the changing fortunes of the war. The once slow and inevitable defeat was rapidly turning into a total victory, but Terran rage at the Pankin had not abated, and it was growing concerning. Will they fight without allies? Someone asked, and that brought a general round of laughter. Daring solo operations by human officers were as much a routine as sunrises now. They are not a totally irrational species. If we offer to make it a war crime galaxy-wide to ever harm their young under any circumstances, and to immediately hand anyone who does so over to the Terran government for trial and disposal, they might recognize the value of this and make peace with the Pankin along with the rest of us, the revered speaker suggested. Will that really be enough for them? It was a reasonable question. We think so, the revered speaker said, and then moved to take a vote. 